Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Harvest. Harvest family, we're glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. And those of you who are joining us live on Facebook, thank you for joining in. We trust that the Lord will minister to you and bless you on this wonderful Sunday morning. And again, thank you for being here. Let's uh, begin our time. Let me pray, and then I'm going to follow that with some scripture reading that ties into our first song of worship. But uh, let's pray, and then I'll read our scripture. So bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, again, it's good to gather as your children in, a, in one location and uh, honor you and lift you up. We thank you for those who are joining us this morning on Facebook Live. Thank you for uh, joining us when we pray that, uh, Father God, you would encourage their heart, whatever they may be wrestling with, Lord, may you through your spirit and maybe even through the word that is uh, shared through song as well as scripture would bring encouragement to them. And so, Father, thank you so much, and we commit this time, this uh, service to you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship is from John chapter 4, and it's regarding the woman at the well. She comes and Jesus addresses and speaks to her. And uh, here's how the story goes. Again, John chapter 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Well, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Well, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become to him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Here ends the reading of God's word. All right, would you please stand and we'll begin our worship set. Of his mercy 
We just have, if you have, you can have a seat for a moment. We just have a few announcements uh, today after our uh, service. The Thrive Group, which is our senior ministry, will be meeting at the Westport Spice uh, Shop, and we will be having spaghetti dinner and some fellowship and time uh, with the sheriff. We'll share about uh, how to avoid getting taken advantage of on emails and phone calls and things like that. So we're looking forward to that for those of us in the senior ministry. Um, also on Friday night, the 3rd of July, we're going to have our own church celebration for uh, 4th of July. So if you would like to come and share some fireworks, share some snacks, and maybe bring a chair, we're going to sit out in the parking lot and enjoy uh, company and watch each other shoot off some fireworks. So if you like to spend money, but you don't have anybody to watch them, bring them here. <laughs> and if you don't like to spend money, but you like to watch them, come here and somebody else will maybe spend money on fireworks. So that'll be our uh, Friday night. So I believe there's men's ministry tomorrow night. No, no men's ministry tomorrow night. Okay. And women, if you'd like to get in on the Zoom uh, devotional call, that'll be Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. So that's all we have for announcements. All right, would you please stand and we will continue with the worship set.
has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Hope for the hopeless and all who's in strain. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burden.
Well, at this time, we want to bring back our children's message. And so, young people, if you would come up here and join me, here's what you're going to do. You're going to sit in the front row facing me. So grab a seat and have a chair here. Uh -huh. Good, good, good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming up here. Well, this morning, I brought with me a spoon. And this is a reminder of uh, my mom when I was growing up. Mom had a wooden spoon. And so when Pastor Brian was your guys' age and he was naughty, my mom would get the wooden spoon and give me a little whack on the bottom. Okay? Uh huh. Okay. Very good. Very good. So, do you guys have something like a wooden spoon in your home? Uh, yeah. 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 I know when mom would grab the spoon, I just okay. <laughs> All right. I was just joking. <laughs> well, anyhow. The reason I bring this is, well, not only to tell you a little bit of story about my life when I was your size and your age, but uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the government. And you've probably heard this name, this word, the government. Uh, well, the government is in charge. And what we learn in the Bible is that the government has a wooden spoon, too. Not a real wooden spoon like this, but if you're a naughty person in the country... The government comes after you, okay? So we're going to talk about more about that, okay? And uh, But if you're good, the Bible says, but if you're good, hey, don't worry. Don't worry at all. But if you are a naughty wrongdoer, the Bible says, beware, because the government does not bear the spoon for nothing, all right? Great. Well, anyhow, thanks for coming up, guys, over here. There is a basket with a little piece of candy in there. Help yourself. All right. Thanks for coming up. Well, this morning's message is entitled Mom's Wooden Spoon. All right. And uh, we are in a series of messages on the book of Romans. And it so happens, I don't know if this is coincidence or what, but we're going to be talking about the government this morning. And of course, I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, it's not coincidence, okay? God is in charge, and uh, I just have to believe that we as a church 
happened to be coming upon a very important uh, chapter in Romans, which is Romans chapter 13, and it talks about our relationship as believers, our relationship with the government, you know, how are we to respond to the government, what is our duty and responsibility as followers, okay, as followers of Jesus Christ, what, are, what is our relationship with the government. Well, we're going to be talking about that this morning. Uh, first of all, let's read that scripture passage together. And uh, that's in Romans, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13. So if you have a copy of God's Word, the Bible with you, would you join me in turning to Romans 13? And those of you who are with us on Facebook Live, uh, go ahead and grab a copy of God's Word and follow along with me as I read through the first uh, seven verses of Romans chapter 13. The title of this particular chapter here, at least in my Bible, the NIV says, Submission to the Authorities. So let's read about that at this time. Verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be, fr do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone, that you, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Well, this morning as we work through chapter 13 here, those first seven verses... What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to bring to you a number of observations uh, based on this text of Scripture, these first seven verses, a number of observations. Uh, there are 14 observations that I would like to share with you. And as I say observations, I'm not talking about pastoral opinion here. No, rather, I'm bringing to you some truths, some observations that I believe are rooted in Scripture. And I believe these are some things that God wants us to understand regarding our relationship with the governing authorities. Now, in addition to also chapter 13 here, I'll be making some observations drawing from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, just to kind of let you know. So let's talk about our relationship as, Jesus, as followers of Jesus Christ. We're believers. What are we to do? What is our responsibility? What is the expectation of us as Christ followers regarding the relationship we are to have with those who are in authority over us. As I said, I want to bring to you 14 observations. So let's do that. We're going to jump right into it. And I'm going to share with you 14 observations. Again, these are not opinions, but uh, these are observations, uh, some truths that are rooted in what God has shared with us. Okay? So let's talk about these 14 observations. Number one is this. Government is God's design. Okay, that's number one. That's in verse one there. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. So number one, the observation is the government, those in authority, have been put in place by God. Okay, that's number one. Number two, there is no perfect form of government, for man is imperfect. There's no perfect form of government for man is imperfect. Number one, God is the designer of government. And uh, 
we know, since God is perfect, His form of government is perfect, but He has chosen to allow mankind to institute something that He has designed. And therefore, since man is faulty, we do not have a perfect form of government. Number three, it says in verse one, everyone must submit to the governing authorities. I want to make two further observations regarding that. Notice that it begins in verse one. There's a word that says everyone. All right. Everyone must submit. So there are no ex uh, exceptions. Okay. Uh, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not exempt from following the government. So that's the first observation. So everyone is to submit to the governing authorities. And then the second observation is the word submit. So everyone is to submit. Now, the word submit is a military term. And uh, what that really means when you submit, especially when it refers to the military, if you are a soldier, you fall into line under the command. Okay, that's what you're supposed to do. As a good soldier, you take your place under the authority of your sergeant or whoever is in command over you. And this submission is volitional. Okay, you make the decision to be in submission. So we are to submit. Everyone is to submit. And remember, submit is to come under the authority. But also remember, this submission is volitional. You make the choice to be in submission to your authorities. That was number three. Number four. All authority has been established by God, and that's been already read for us. Everyone must submit to the, uh, himself to the governing authorities. Verse 1 says, For there is no authority except that which God has established. So God establishes the authority. Here's a couple of extra Bible passages. Uh, you perhaps heard these in the book of Daniel. In verse 21, we read this. Uh, God changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. Again, referring to how God establishes the governing rule. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. The decision is announced by messengers. Uh, the holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. Again, making reference to the fact that uh, governments that are in existence, those who are serving in, those, in that capacity of authority, they have been placed there by God. Okay? So all authority has been established by God. Number five, rebelling against government is rebelling against God. Okay? To rebel against the government is to rebel against God. Look at uh, verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. So rebelling against government is rebelling against God. Number six. If we choose to rebel, number six is this. Rebellion will be punished. Again, we're making observations from our text this morning. Observations that are based on the truth of God. Look at verse 2. Those who do so, who rebel, will bring judgment on themselves. That's in verse 2. So rebellion will be punished. Number 7. The authorities are God's servants. Let's take a look at verse 4 there in chapter 13. It says, the authorities are God's servants to do you good. So the authorities are God's servant. God uses, listen to this, God uses unsaved, those who have nothing to do with God, God uses them as well as those who claim to be followers of God. He uses them both. Those who do not believe in God as well as those who believe. He uses them both to accomplish his objectives. And they are servants, okay? Whether they realize that or not, the individual that's been placed in service is a servant of God. Okay, they're a servant of God. Now, for example, in the book of Esther, uh, you remember the story well, how uh, the Jewish people were, uh, I guess, online to be annihilated by uh, the authorities there. But Esther went to the Persian king 
And uh, the Persian king, again, an unbeliever, uh, the Persian king uh, did some changes that allowed the Jewish people to survive. So God used the Persian king. Also in the book of Nehemiah, God uses the Assyrian king, Artaxerxes. And uh, so Nehemiah went to Artaxerxes and asked him, would you help me build the walls of Jerusalem? And of course, again, uh, uh, an individual, a man who does not believe in God, uh, goes ahead and helps. So what we see here is that all authority, whether they believe in God or not, are God's servants, and God uses them. He uses them. So that's number seven. The authorities are God's servants. Number eight, the authorities are in place to deal with wrongdoers. The authorities are in place to deal with wrongdoers. Again, chapter 13, verse 4. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Okay? So it's within the authority's right, because God has given this authority, this authority is to deal with those who are doing wrong. That's what it says there in verse 4. Number 9, observation number 9. The authorities may use force if necessary. Again, we're still in chapter, verse 4. Take a look at it with me. It says, For he is God's servant to do good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. Okay, the, the governing authorities or the government, they do not bear the sword for nothing. So that suggests to us that the government can use force to bring an uprising or a riot or whatever it may be, or a criminal to bring them to justice, and they can use force. That's what I believe that Scripture is telling us here. In fact, a lot of, there's a big debate you know, regarding capital punishment, whether you should engage in capital punishment or not. You know, We have both camps about that. A uh, passage that often is quoted in Scripture regarding the supporting of capital punishment is this passage here in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. The government, the authorities, do not bear the sword for nothing. So therefore, we fear if we are doing wrong. So, authorities may use force if necessary. If you do wrong, be afraid, for mom does not bear the wooden spoon for nothing. All right? Number 10, an observation from verse 7. Feelings do not override truth. Feelings do not override truth. Verse 7 says, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now we all have been in that situation where we do not feel like doing what we're supposed to do. We don't feel like paying taxes, right? Uh, Who's ever is serving as our president or our governor or, or whatever, sometimes we do not feel like giving them any kind of honor or respect. We do not like the way they act, what they do, whatever it means. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? So our feelings do become involved. But when it comes to truth, which is God's truth, which is our standard that we are to live by, our feelings do not take precedence over God's truth. Okay? So we as followers of Christ, we need to be aware of our feelings. Uh, it's human to have feelings, no doubt. That's okay. But we need to bring ourselves... Again, that word submission, submit, we need to submit to God's word. We need to fall into rank. He, God, is our authority. We need to come under his authority and uh, practice what he wants us to do. Not our feelings, not our feelings. Let me just share a little light illustration here. This will bring a little fun to you, okay? A young boy who wanted $100 very badly prayed for two weeks, but nothing happened. Then he decided to write God a letter requesting $100. 
When the postal authorities received the boy's letter to God, they decided to send it to the President of the United States. The President was so amused, you know, that he instructed his secretary to send the boy $50 from God. The President thought that this would be a lot of money to the little boy and thus satisfy him. Well, the little boy, he was delighted with the $50, and he immediately wrote back a thank you note to God that read this way. Dear God, thank you very much for sending me money. However, I noticed that for some reason, you had to send it through Washington, D.C., and as usual, the politicians took half of it. <laughs> Observation number 11. Christians are God's defense against chaos. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a defense against the chaos. Here we depart from Romans 13 and we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's what it says. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Now we're jumping right into a passage without any kind of context here. You're kind of wondering, okay, what's this verse all about? In chapter 2, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Thessalonian believers, and he is informing the Thessalonian believers that the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom and his rule, that has not taken place yet. Okay? It has not taken place. For some reason, the Thessalonian believers were thinking they must be in the end times. But Paul's saying, no, that's not the case at all. All right? Um, and there were some things that he said. But one of the things he did say is, uh, we know that it's not the end yet, the end times when the Antichrist is ruling. We know it hasn't happened yet because the one who restrains has not been taken out. And of course, the one who restrains at this time in our season of life, at our time, is the Holy Spirit. That's how I, I believe uh, chapter 2 is reading. Since the Holy Spirit is here at this time and has not been removed, um, the man of lawlessness has not, been re, uh, re, has not been revealed. Now, let's push this a little bit further. The Holy Spirit occupies believers, doesn't he? You as a follower of Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit living in you. And therefore, once the uh, restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is taken away, that also means that the believers have been taken away from this world. That is the rapture. Okay, that's the future event in the future. But that has not taken place. But once the rapture does take place and the Christians, the church, is removed from this world, the Holy Spirit is gone as well, and then all chaos breaks loose. It's going to be a bad, bad time. But fortunately, as I believe, you know, we as a church will be taken out of that time. And we won't experience any, that major evil ca uh, chaos and so forth. So, the restrainer is now still present. You have the restrainer living within you. Therefore, you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as you stand for truth, as you stand for right, as you stand against evil and wrong, you are that defense that prevents chaos from entering into our world. Christians are God's defense against chaos. That's why we're important. You know, we talk about, does my vote matter? You know, if, if I say something, th does that matter? Well, I believe it does. I believe it does. God uses you as a defense against everything going crazy on us. Number 12, government is God's vehicle for his end times program. Let me say that again. Government is God's vehicle for his end times program. Again, we're in 2 Thessalonians, and here's the passage. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, 
so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And of course, when we refer to the man of lawlessness here in this particular passage, we're referring to the Antichrist who will one day come on the scene and he will take power. He will become the world ruler at that time. And, uh, and then things will really go south, okay, because of this man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. But what I want you to understand, this is going to come through government, okay? He's a, a ruler, a one world ruler, and he will do whatever it is, manipulation and so forth, uh, intimidation, whatever is necessary, you know, to hold his position and to bring others under his his authority, and uh, but what we need to understand as believers is that you know God is going to use government to bring about His greater plan. So just again, government is God's vehicle for the end time program. Number thirteen, government is not your savior. You're going okay. I get that right. Philippians chapter two. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Government is not your Savior. Number 14. Remember we talked about 14 observations. Here it is. The only true fix to mankind's turmoil is a changed heart. Government is not our Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Government can't change the evilness of man's heart. Government can't save man, but Jesus Christ can. The only true fix to man's turmoil is a changed heart. Fourteen observations regarding government. Let me talk to you about application. What am I supposed to do with all this stuff, right? Uh, number one, here's what I want you to understand as followers of Jesus. God is sovereign. Camp on that word, sovereign. Okay, God is sovereign, which means God is in control of everything. He's in control. God is not surprised by anything. You know, nobody sneaks up on him and does something that he did not perceive was going to take place. I mean, God is in control. And God has a plan. And we talk about, you know, people, you know, the government so forth having an agenda. Well, understand, God has agenda, and his agenda will trump what we are experiencing here on earth. Okay? So he's in control. And that I share that with you because that is such a, a comfort for me. Because if you watch the news, and you see what's going on, man, you just get really riled up. I mean, you get frustrated. You get, you get anxious. I mean, all that stuff comes to you. You know, we, we, how are we going to stop this? You know, we got to vote the right person in. And on and on and on we go. Boy, it sure is refreshing for me, and I think it'll be for you as well if you'll just step back and say, oh, wait a minute, who's in charge here? Who's in control? God is. And that's where the peace comes in, knowing that he is the sovereign one. He's in control. And now I'm going to throw something at you real quick here, and I'm not going to give you a lot of explanation. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to explore this on your own. Okay, so this is one of your assignments. You're going to have to dig into this. You're going to have to pray this through. You're going to have to uh, pursue Scripture, the Bible, and come up with your conviction on this, all right? But here it is. It's called civil disobedience, all right? I'm not saying you have to do that, but here's what I want to share with you. We see some examples taking place in God's Word, in the Bible. Uh, here's just some examples. Uh, when we're in Exodus chapter 1, we have the story of Moses, and the Egyptians said that all male Jewish babies were to be killed. And of course, the midwife did not kill 
baby Moses. And of course, Moses went on to become a significant, you know, major icon in you know Christian history. But here we have midwives saying, "No, I'm not going to do what the authority says." So we have something regarding life taking place here. Government says, "I want you to destroy life," but there was civil disobedience in order to protect life. Another example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember his story, their story in, the, uh, in Daniel, the book of Daniel? Go ahead and read it. Um, the king built an idol, and the king's instruction to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and everybody is, you need to bow down and worship the idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we can't do that, king. We can't do that. And of course, they went into the fire, the fiery furnace, because of that. But here we have them engaging in civil disobedience regarding who is to be God. Who is it we are to worship and give our allegiance to? Since it wasn't God, they felt the conviction within their own heart that they could not uphold this rule that the king had declared. Continuing with Daniel, let's talk about Daniel. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Why was that? Because he wouldn't pray to the king. The king says, you need to be praying to me. I am the object of your honor, respect, and so forth. Daniel says, no, I can't do that, king, because there's only one God, and you're not it. Therefore, Daniel disobeyed, and he was put in the lion's den. Okay? And then there's Peter. We're going to the New Testament. We're in Peter. Uh, Peter was thrown in jail, uh, mainly because he was talking about Jesus. Well, I shouldn't say mainly. I mean, that is why he was thrown in jail. He was talking about Jesus. People's lives were being changed. And the religious authorities, those sticks in the mud, said, hey, you can't be doing stuff like that. We forbid you to talk about this Jesus. And Peter says this, you know, we must obey God not man. Okay? And that was regarding the proclamation of the truth, the true true truth, okay, which is God himself. So we have some civil disobedience regarding wife, wife, we sorry about that. <laughs> I'm in trouble now for sure. <laughs> Tells you who's the rule in our house, right? Okay. <laughs> No, nah, she's, she's a good wife. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, regarding life, okay, there was life, taking of life. They said, no, we can't do that. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was regarding worship and allegiance. They said, no, we, we can't, you can't be it, king. We, God is ours. When it came to prayer, you know, praying to the king, Daniel says, no, I can't do that. And uh, Peter, they were trying to shut him down, talking about, the, the thing that will change man's heart. They were trying to shut him down. And he says, no, I, I got to, God has called me. Peter says, God has called me to preach, to share about Jesus Christ. And so I, I got to do that. If you're going to throw me in jail, throw me in jail. But I can't go against what God has called me to do. Again, as I said, this is your, you got to develop these convictions, okay? You got to develop these convictions. So that brings us to the end. You kind of know your assignments, hopefully. Uh, let me close this out with a benediction. Here's our benediction. During these days of turmoil and uncertainty, rest in the one who is sovereign over all things. God is not surprised. God is in control. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion.